In this video we're going to learn about a way to pick useful features out of our model for the midband using a technique called open circuit time constants. Open circuit time constants, or OCTC, are a circuit feature that is part of a bandwidth estimation technique which was invented at MIT in the 1960s. Bandwidth estimates made with OCTC have lots of nice properties, like being conservative and granting intuition about which capacitors are slowing a circuit down. Um, the heart of the technique is simplifying the midband transform function model that we just made. Specifically, we simplify it by realizing that we only care about the high f dominant high frequency pole. Because that pole is dominant, modeling this as a first order system is reasonably safe, and we'll see there's a way to do it easily and accurately. The first simplification we're going to make is getting rid of the low frequency pole zero pairs, because we're operating at a frequency well above any of the PZI. That means uh, each pole zero pair in this is equal to one, because S is greater than the associated PZI, and so it just cancels with a term of S on the top. That leaves us with this reduced transfer function in terms of the tau i, so great. Um, this looks much simpler already. Um, I have substituted in the frequency we're operating at, j omega minus 3 dB, in for s in this transfer function, I've also expanded the denominator. The expanded denominator lets us realize that all these high order s terms are going to be pretty close to zero. That's because tau i times omega minus 3 dBh is, uh, or tau 1 times omega minus 3 dBh is 1 by definition at the dominant pole, and every other tau i is smaller than tau 1. So multiplying those terms by omega minus 3 dBh is going to result in very small numbers. So that leaves us with an interesting first order approximation for this many pole system in the region that it starts rolling off. Um, which is the interesting one for bandwidth estimation. And using this approximation only relies on us making sure we're looking at high frequencies and that one pole is dominant. Okay, so that's great. We have an expression for the dominant pole location, but we don't know the tau i. And our experience with the common emitter tells us we can't find these tau i just by thevenizing at capacitors because poles aren't linked to a specific cap. Uh, and that still leaves us in a tough spot trying to sort out what each of these taus are. Fortunately, this OCTC technique got written and it used some circuit wizardry to show that the sum of tau i is equal to the sum of OCTC i, where each OCTC is a capacitance, multiplied by the Thevenin resistance seen from the capacitor terminals, under the condition that all other capacitors are open circuits. This second bullet uh, here just reiterates that this sum of tau i is equal to the 3 dB corner that we're trying to estimate. So if we knew the sum of these open circuit time constants, then we can estimate our bandwidth really effectively. So let's take this for a test drive. Pause the video and try writing down the open circuit time constants for this circuit and seeing if the time constant, the open circuit time constants predict, lines up with a full analysis of the circuit. The first open circuit time constant for C1 uh, is equal to R times C1. That's because C2 will be an open circuit, so looking out of the terminals of C1, we'll just see R to ground. The second open circuit time constant, OCTC2 for C2, will be R times C2, because this will be an open circuit, and just looking out of C2, we'll see R to ground. Um, so open circuit time constants predicts the corner frequency of this system will be tau is equal to RC1 plus RC2. Um, and that matches up exactly with the exact transfer function. And I just found this by pretending C1 and C2 were in parallel and doing uh, R parallel 1 over C effective times S. Um, so an exact match for the time constant is a pretty good performance for this estimation technique. It looks like it's doing pretty good. Uh, however, you know, this is a kind of trivial example. These caps are in parallel. This system's first order. Um, so just to uh, really prove that th this method works, let's try a trickier circuit. 
pause the video and find the open circuit time constants for this circuit. Don't find the exact transfer function for it unless you're bored because it's a bunch of tedious algebra. I'll give you the exact transfer function for comparison um, when we go over the open circuit time constants uh, after the break. Um, and I've included a derivation uh, of the full transfer function in appendix on the notes online. So pause the video, find the open circuit time constants. The first open circuit time constant is given by C1 times R1. Um, when we're finding the open circuit time constant for C1, we pretend C2 is an open circuit, which means R2 is just kind of floating, right? This V out node isn't connected to anything. So the only path to ground from C1 is through R1. The second open circuit time constant is equal to C2 times R1 plus R2. It's because C1 is an open circuit, so the only path to ground is through both of those resistors. So that means our estimated bandwidth is going to be R1 times C1 plus C2 plus R2 times C2. And excuse me, our estimated time constant is going to be R1 times C1 plus C2 plus R2 C2. I've included the exact transfer function for this uh, equation down here, and you can see that our S terms are equal to R1 C1 plus R1 C2 plus R2 C2, and that exactly lines up with our time constant. So we can find our first order approximation for a multipole system exactly using open circuit time constants. Now, one important note is that we don't find the open circuit time constant for every cap when we're estimating bandwidth. And that's because we want to ignore caps that cause low frequency pole zero pairs. We've assumed that all of these terms are already equal to one. Um, we expect those caps will always be already be shorted at omega minus 3 dBH, so we should replace them with wires when we find the open circuit time constant. So, fine, this is a good thing to know, but it's tricky in practice, because we have to learn how to identify which caps cause low frequency pole zero pairs, and which caps cause high frequency poles. Um, so the easiest way to identify those is long experience. Um, when I look at a circuit, I know roughly what caps are put there for, and so I've got some quick uh, heuristics I use to guess um, which caps are intended to cause low frequency pole zero pairs and which are intended to cause high frequency poles. So for instance, um, coupling caps and bypass caps are almost always low frequency pole zero pairs. Caps built into devices and the load cap are almost always high frequency poles. Um, you can also use a circuit trick to decide what caps cause high frequency poles and what caps cause low frequency pole zero pairs. Um, and this trick starts by imagining that I'm operating in the midband and gradually increasing my frequency. So what's going to happen in the circuit as the frequency increases is that high frequency pole causing caps are going to become short. And what happens in my midband picture is that my gain decreases. So if I look at my circuit and I replace a cap with a short and it causes my gain to drop, then I know that cap has to be cause a high frequency pole. Um, so the classic example here would be CL. If I replace that with a short, my gain goes to zero, so CL must be a high frequency pole causing cap. Um, on the other hand, if I replace CC with a short, that makes my gain go from zero if it's open to something uh, mid-band looking if it's shorted. So this potentially increases my gain, uh, and therefore it can't be a high frequency pole causing cap. Um, on the other hand, we can also identify zero causing caps because opening them reduces our gain. So here, if I replace CC with an open circuit, um, my gain drops to zero because no signal gets into the amplifier. Uh, so it must be cause low frequency pole zero pairs. If I replace CL with an open circuit, uh, my gain is unchanged or better, so it has to be associated with high frequencies. Um, and we got came to that by the same reasoning here. If I start in my midband and I'm decreasing my frequency, uh, as frequency go down, caps open up and my gain drops. So any caps that reduce my gain when they open have to cause low frequency pole zero pairs. Um, one that's of particular interest is CE. Um, which is a low frequency pole zero pair causing cap 
when we open it up, this amplifier goes from a common emitter to a degenerated common emitter, and so our gain drops from GMRC to RC over RE. So, in summary, predict your high frequency dominated, dominant pole using the sum of open circuit time constants. Um, so the sum of these time constants is going to be equal to tau minus 3 dBh, where the open circuit time constant is a cap times the Thevenin resistance seen from the cap under the condition that all of the other caps are open. And when we're doing this, we need to leave zero causing caps out of the analysis uh, because they're already shorted at omega minus 3 dBh. Uh, so that's usually coupling and bypass caps. Um, and uh, you can also identify caps to leave out because opening them will reduce your gain.